seated. But let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. After almost two months of being able to finally be together, God, we know that our other brothers and sisters are watching online, and someday we will all be back together. But God, we thank you for this opportunity to have our doors open, literally. And God, I think it's great, it's wonderful that we are excited to be here. And so God, I pray one thing we take away from that is what are we going to feel like in six months when we're back at church? When that's, when that, you know, those next six months we're at church, we're at church. And are we going to have this same excitement and awe and just desire and just this feeling of being blessed to be inside of your house? God, we talk about that word revival. We use it quite a bit. And, but God, it's, it's up to us whether or not we have one. It's up to us whether or not we allow the, the, the fire of your spirit to burn in us. Or we could very easily quench it. And so, God, we do have an opportunity in front of us that this feeling of just awe of being back in the house uh, your house and being around uh, brothers and sisters again. God, even with all of kind of the awkwardness that is here with the changes and the differences and all that's eventually going to go away. We, we know that. And, but God, do we, do we want it to really go back to that term of normal? It's, in some ways, yes. But God, I actually, I, I pray that us as a church and us as individuals, God, we don't want necessarily that normalcy. But we want to go beyond. We want to, we want to try something new. We want to go in different, different directions. We want to just make our relationship with you deeper. Because God, maybe for some of us, normal is the place that we should not want to go back to when it comes to our spiritual lives. Because normal just wasn't good enough. Normal is really another way of just saying we plateaued. And so God, we can take what we have all been experiencing, and we can use it to give us that fuel and that fire to just grow our, our lives with you, God. And again, this energy that we have, and just this excitement of being back together, something that I've heard from practically everybody. They're so excited to finally come back into the church. God, will we have that in six months? Will we have that in a year? Some of us, will we even have it next week, God? Or... We'll just kind of get back into the normalcy. And then from there, we slowly just start to lose that enthusiasm, that fire, that desire. God, I do thank you. I know that many other churches are using this Sunday to say we're still here. Our doors are open. And God, really what it reflects is even if you strip away uh, the, the, be the beautiful buildings that we have and all the equipment, you are still here. You are still God. You are, are, things look different. They feel different. But God, you are not different. The God that we celebrated, oh, I think March 15th, the last Sunday we had together, is still the same God that carried us through these last few weeks, the same God that's here this morning, the same God that's in the houses of our brothers and sisters, the same God that's in the baptistry of the church, the Lutheran church, the Presbyterian church, the same God, all of them, amongst all of it, because you are not a God of barriers, you are not a God who changes. And so we celebrate you, the same God we celebrated weeks ago. And God, we are going to trust in you to continue to pull us through. And God, that we place our faith not on the government, not even really in the medical field. God, our faith is in you. You bring us through. You are the great healer. You are in charge. You are in control. God, thank you for this opportunity to be back here. And God, I truly pray that we've all learned something, we've all been shown something about our walk with you during this time. Maybe areas where we need to grow, areas where we need to show more faith. Or maybe things were confirmed for us that we just need to confirm. But God, I thank you that you've not been silent through any of this. 
You've not been dormant through any of this. But you are here, and you are with us. Thank you, God. Amen. So this feels right. Uh, I can honestly tell you I did not enjoy the puppets as much as it may have come across. Um, but this feels right, and it feels good. And I'm so happy to see you all here and others that, are, uh, that we'll watch later and others that may be watching uh, right now live on Facebook. Um, but this is exciting, and it's just so great to see all of you. And again, I, I kind of view this as, you know, the government's going through phases, we are too. So the hope is that our phase two will be next month that we open everything back up. Our Sunday schools, our Sunday nights, our Wednesday nights. We're going to play all that by ear, and of course I'll keep you updated. But that is the plan, and that is the hope uh, that we're going to get everything going again. We were just weeks away from starting our new Sunday school and our new Sunday night. That hasn't gone anywhere. It's going to come back. If you have, I'm going to tell you right now, if you have not done your spiritual gifts test after all of this, I have no more hope or faith in you. you got to get it done, okay? You've, you've had more time than I ever imagined you getting it done, all right? Because we're still going to do that. I promise you we are still going to uh, go over the, the results and share those with you. Um, so there's even a few left in the back. I, I promise you we are. So all this stuff that has been altered, we're going to do them, okay? We, we are not going to just ignore it. Um, you know, and of course, for what we're asking right now, for your tithes and your offerings, you can see the plate, just throw it in there. Of course, you can still give online, or many of you have been mailing it into the church. You can do that as well. But just so you know, we won't have a time of offering. Just drop it in the plate over there. And I would encourage you, um, it was nice. Liz and I went out on our porch this morning. We did our devotions together and had some coffee, and it was kind of like our little Sunday school. You have more time in the morning now uh, than we normally would. Um, so... You know, have, have a Sunday school um, there with your family uh, or with yourself or whatever it is. But uh, take advantage of that time. You would normally be in church anyway. So uh, have church in your home there. And um, it will help keep you in, the, in that routine um, of waking up when you, when you would normally wake up and, and all that stuff as well. But uh, good to have everybody here. And look forward to when everybody else can finally be back in. Um, again, your health is more important. So please just go by what you feel is right for you. Um, but again, it's great to have all of you here with us as well. This morning we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And then later we'll hop over to the New Testament. But we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 16. So obviously Liz and I, we've been to events or places, whatever, where we're around a lot of people. And everyone around me may think that I'm, I'm feeling fine or I'm comfortable, but what they don't know is I'm actually very uncomfortable. Um, you know, Liz will pull me aside and ask if I'm all right or ask if I'm ready to go because she knows that I just don't really enjoy being in large groups. I get very uncomfortable around large numbers of people, especially if I don't know them. I don't like crowds um, or anything like that. So she knows, but she sees what other people don't see. There have been times in the past where I've gone to Indiana to visit my family, and I'm not even through the door yet, and it's like my mom comes up, she'll ask me, what's wrong? I, I just see there's something wrong. And, you know, maybe something had occurred earlier in the week, or something had just been eating at my mind, and I didn't even tell her. I thought I was doing a good job at hiding it, but a mother sees what nobody else uh, can see as well. And I'm sure that you've experienced this with somebody, that maybe you have one or two people that it just seems they can always see past the exterior and they can see what's going on in your heart or in your mind. On the surface, maybe most people see a very calm and restful soul, but there's that one person who knows that maybe underneath there's just a torrential downpour of emotion. There are those who can see right through any form of an image that we created to hide our true selves in. Maybe they're friends, maybe they're family, but there are those who can come along and say to you, this isn't you. You know, what's going on? Is there something happening in your life? There are those who don't assume something just because you look a certain way, or act a certain way, or have a certain background. And I believe this is incredibly crucial to have if you want to have a strong relationship with somebody. Now, of course, God always knows 
And God always sees exactly what's going on inside. He sees people for who they really are and also what they will become. He sees the brokenness behind the smile. He sees the strength in those who would scoff at us. He sees what the rest of us either miss or what the rest of us choose to miss. So I just want to read two verses here in 1 Samuel 16 through 7, uh, 6 through 7. Uh, I know that you'd be familiar with this verse. When they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we know that King Saul had fallen out of favor with God because he became a man of sin. So God sends the prophet Samuel out to go find a new king. And the Lord tells him to go see a man named Jesse. And there he will find the new king. And upon arrival, Samuel meets Jesse's eldest son, Eva, and assumes that this is the reason why God sent me to Jesse's house. And apparently this son was a guy who must have looked like a king. I kind of picture him maybe handsome and you know, tall and, and muscular, maybe had a really cool looking beard. I don't know. Um, he was the older one. We know that. But again, he had something that look that people would just want to follow. He looked like a king. But of course, we also know that Saul also had a look to him as well, a look that people like, and we know exactly how that turned out for them. And so here God gives us the lesson, the lesson that many of us, if you're raised in the church, we, we've heard this the lesson for a very long time, but the lesson of that we are to look past the appearance of a person and see their heart. David, as we know, was chosen to be the future king because he was a servant of God, a man after God's own heart, as we are later, later told about this, about this man. There's just something different about him. It was his heart that made him stand out, not his appearance. Liz and I, the early stages of our adoption, we had to do a ton, a ton, a ton of training. Some of it was online. Most of it, we would have to travel somewhere, and it was in person. And one of them was, um, it was like, I don't know, it was, like, it was over two days. It was like six days each day. And then we had to meet with our agent afterwards. And it was all about what it, it was, it was for international families only, but it was all about what it takes to be a blended family. That what we may face being a blended family. Because odds are, Sophia is not going to look like Liz or I, right? She doesn't have our genes. Her features, her skin color, maybe her accent is going to be a little different. And so our home study agent talked to us about how there's going to be struggles you face as a blended family simply because of the type of world that we live in. So how are we as parents going to respond when she hears comments from kids at school about how she looks different than her mom and dad, or how she sounds different from her mother and father? How will we react when she's treated differently, or maybe like less of a human, because her skin color is different, or again, because she sounds different? What about when she comes home crying because the boy she likes isn't allowed to take her to the dance because the parents don't want their son associating with a girl from a different nationality? She'll be judged simply because she's different from them. And our agent made it very clear to us that we're going to have to deal with people judging our daughter because she looks different. They are not going to see her heart. Instead, they will see her appearance and they will make archaic assumptions about who she is as a person. We've already taken quite a bit of backlash for not adopting in this country. So it's already began and she's not here. There are some who won't even want our child to associate with theirs because of the differences. And sadly, we know that this will even occur with those who call themselves Christian. And I find it quite amazing how many Christians still have issues of maybe a person's skin tone, or where they come from, their background, their nationality, their culture. When Jesus himself was a tan-skinned Middle Eastern man. And it's a very good thing that Jesus didn't come into the world with the focus of people's outer appearance and not their hearts. 
The good thing Jesus didn't come into this world and put himself on a pedestal and stand with only those who look like him or come from where he came from. More Christians must wake up to this point and stop creating disharmony and segregation out of some misguided stance or belief system that God would definitely call sinful. And of course this means we can go the other way with this as well. We see some people and we place them on this high level of importance. Why? Because of how they look. Because of their accolades. Because of the car they drive. Because we know they must have money. But we need to remember that there was nothing physical about Christ that stood out. He didn't look like the man that we have in so many of our paintings. And so the question is, if you were around in the time of Christ, and you stood before him not knowing who he was, would you have made an assumption about him because of his looks? And sadly, for many Christians, the answer would be yes. They would see a Middle Eastern man, and that would be enough to make them come to many different assumptions. I think it's just something for us to think about. There are some who walk this earth who seem to have it all together because it's just how they look. Because it's just how they come across. But inside, maybe they're broken. They're lost. Some people are just flat out evil. Maybe some of these individuals inside, they're crying out for help. But they keep it hidden because the world has told them, you must hold it together. The world tells them, a person like you must always come across strong. You have to make it seem like you always have it together. Now, every once in a while, those people will go out on a limb. They share that they are struggling with something like, a, like depression or some sort of addiction, and the response that they get isn't one of love or help, but of one instead of shock and judgment. And again, this isn't uncommon in the church. You're a Christian. You shouldn't be dealing with anything like that. Maybe you're just not a strong enough believer. And this occurs when a person judges an outside appearance and what happens to that person who stepped out on the limb looking for help? Usually it means they don't seek help and instead they continue to die internally. And so to only view the outside appearance and make, make assumptions causes damage that at times cannot be undone. How many people have taken their lives because in their hurt and the pain they didn't receive understanding, but instead they received judgment from those who assumed something about them? There's a place, I know I'm not saying this right, Akogahara in Japan, where it's what's more commonly known as is the suicide forest. And since 1971, over 100 bodies every single year have been removed from this forest. Now, nobody really knows why that particular spot became the place to commit suicide. It doesn't matter why, the point is that it has. 100 people at least a year. And you can, you can go, it's, it's a place that you can go and tour. Like, it is, it is a national forest. And, but there is a good chance that while you're touring, you will see somebody hanging from a tree. Suicide is the leading, leading cause of death for Japanese men between the ages of 20 and 44. More Japanese children and teenagers killed themselves between 2016 and 2017 than any year since 1986. And we know that this is a culture that teaches you got to have it together. It is, a, it is a culture that deals a lot with shame. Instead of reaching out for help, they take their lives. And it's sad that this is seen as a better choice than letting people know what's really gone, going on in your heart and facing uh, because you're afraid of harsh judgment. We can imagine, what if, what if Samuel ignored God and instead went with the man that was in front of him and declared him king simply because he looked like one? He had that outward appearance. How much damage would have resulted? So friends and I were denied service at three Chinese restaurants and we were not allowed to come into another one when we were in Chinatown, New York City. We were with a Chinese friend of ours and she grew up in the area so she wanted to take us to some of her favorite restaurants um, to get like a little bit here and a little bit, a little bit there. Again, she 
grew up on this particular street. And after being denied service, she got into an argument with one of the owners. She later explained, because of course we had no idea what, what they were talking about, but she later explained to us that they started calling her very, very derogatory names because she was a Chinese girl hanging out with three white kids, boys in particular. And it was incredibly easy to see how hurt our friend was. She was very angry, and she was very embarrassed. And we assured, reassured her that we were fine. But I think what really hurt her was the fact that she and her friends were considered second class. And she was ostracized by her own people because of who she was with. One place said that we had to stand out in the rain, but that she could come in and order for us, but we'd have to take our food to go. She refused, and she continued to walk in the rain with us until we finally got to our destination. She refused to go along with such hatefulness. And God saw something in David that nobody else could see. Remember how he was treated when he said that he would take on Goliath. They laughed and they mocked him. They, they get angry with him. Here is just this scrawny, untrained boy, a shepherd, wanting to go out and fight a giant. I mean, the kid's a fool. But they refused to see the heart, the soul that was in David. But God saw it. And it really wasn't the stones that God used to slay David, or to save to slay Goliath. It was David's heart. It was David's faith. That, it was the faith that slayed the giant Goliath. Amen, yeah. What do we miss out on when we judge from the outward appearance? What troubles do we find ourselves in when we assume we can trust someone just because they have a very nice smile? Or we hate someone because of where they come from. I honestly believe that if you were to run into Satan, he would appear as a very attractive, charismatic man. I believe that the Antichrist will have many of that, much of that same appeal. Humanity is often fooled by a sweet smile and a nice suit. Satan isn't going to appear as this hideous monstrous creature. That's just going to make people run away. That's not going to work. So to set the trap of luring people into his grasp, he needs to seem and also look very inviting. There's a snake called the cantail viper, and what it will do is it will move its tail, it will bury some of it, and it will move its tail to look like a worm. And so a hungry animal will come in to eat that worm, and all of a sudden that snake has now got dinner. Alligator snapping turtles, they'll open their mouths and they'll wiggle their tongue because once again it looks like a worm, a hungry fish comes in, boom, fish is gone. There's the angler fish, I'm sure you've all seen them, if you've seen Finding Nemo, you've seen an angler fish. they got the little lights that kind of dangle from their head, again, fish come in to investigate and then they get gobbled up. Then there's the spider eating assassin bug and this bug actually moves like it's caught inside of the spider's web and then when the spider comes, the spider is now gone. Then there's the Fratoris firefly. It glows like a female firefly, and it lures in poor, dumb male victims, and it gets, gets gobbled up. And then there's another one that's called a Margate, and it's a very small feline, and it mimics the sound. It's actually quite interesting. It mimics the sound of an injured baby monkey. So when the parent monkeys come in to help the baby monkey, the cat gets a free dinner. Now all these creatures, and there, there are so many, so many, so many more, I'm sure you're even thinking of some right now, that there are so many creatures out there that they use a very attractive outward appearance to lure in their soon-to-be meals. 